before you that we would deal with issues we need to deal with. In whatever version you have, Romans 13, I'm going to read verses 11 through 14 in the Holman. Here's how it reads. Beside this, knowing the time, it is already the hour for you to wake up from sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. NAS has almost gone. And the daylight is near. So let us discard the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk in decency as in the daylight, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual impurity and promiscuity, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no plans to satisfy the fleshly desires. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. All right, thank you. Be seated. Paul is bringing his general exhortations to the Roman believers to a close. Um, he started in uh, chapter 12 with some practical admonitions in light of the doctrinal foundation that he had laid. He began first with, uh, with the call for believers to present their bodies a living sacrifice. Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a uh, living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's how Paul began this section. That was in light of what was past. This section that he is in now, these four verses are in light of what is future. And that is the aspect. It's exhortations based on what is to come. Biblically, the day of Christ is imminent. That's a key word there. If you look there on page one in your notes, that's uh, what about seven lines down, eight lines down in the first paragraph. The day of Christ is imminent. That means it can happen at any time. Therefore, as believers, we should live in light of what is to come. I'm reminded of the passage in Chronicles which spoke of the men of Issachar. Just a brief passage. You, have, uh, you don't have the reference. It's 1 Chronicles 12.32 if you want to write it down. 1 Chronicles 12.32 says this, And the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. We need to understand our time. We need to know what time it is. We need to know biblically where we are and we need to know what we need to do. And of course, Paul tells us there are, there are a series of exhortations. Let us, let us, let us is the way that the, the King, jo King James uh, reads that. But the idea is that, that they are exhortations uh, commands. Paul is imploring us as believers to do this. Now he says, knowing the time. What time is it? We all want to look at our watch, don't we? He tells us the night is far spent and the day is at hand. What day is that? Paul is speaking of the day of Christ's return. Now this is clear because he speaks there um, in verse 11 now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. It's a broader picture. It's not simply night and day, one, light, one period of light and darkness, but he's speaking of our salvation being nearer. Now, in what sense is he talking about salvation being nearer? We have this term, you know, have you been saved? I went up to, we had the, the dinner at the Tuesday night, the spaghetti supper. Some of y'all were there. Uh, I went up and I got to a table and I said, is this seat saved? And the person says, no, but we've been praying for it and we believe it's under deep conviction. <laughs> well, we, we speak of our salvation in past tense, all right? Um, I have been saved. That is the, the theological term, the biblical term, Romans term, Paul's term, justification. Justification means that we have been saved declared righteous before God. That's past tense. That's in the aorist tense. Point in time action. We are saved. We have been saved. There's also a present tense to our salvation. 
I recall hearing of someone who said they didn't sin anymore. And I thought, well, that's a lie right there. You know, you still do, sure enough. Uh, the reality is, as long as we are in this body of flesh, we will sin. We should sin less, but we will never be sinless. And that is the present continuing aspect of our salvation. As we walk with the Lord, as we hide his word in our heart, Psalm 119, thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word, David says. So when we focus on scripture, that helps us. Uh, the idea of giving ourselves, presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice, all of these things are involved in the progressive and the present continuing aspect of our salvation. We are being saved from the power of sin through the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit who strengthens us in our struggle with sin. Now, that's an, it's a key phrase there, our struggle with sin. It is intended to be a struggle. It is intended to be a battle. It's not something that we just give up to. I recall hearing someone say they don't have any problem with temptation at all. They just give in. Uh, well, that's a problem. That is a problem. So the idea is that, that we should be experiencing the process of sanctification. We are being saved. But guess what? As long as we're in this body of flesh, the ravages of sin will impact us. I've been trying to get in shape a little bit better, and I, I would contend and argue that I have always been in shape. Uh, round is a shape. Uh, but in any case, uh, the idea is that uh, as I began exercise, I started kind of walking and, and exercising, and out, there's, a little, uh, there's a little loop trail that goes around the reservoir. Uh, it's about 3.1 miles, depending on if you follow that, or my GPS sometimes says it's 3.3 miles. But in any case, it's a little loop around there. And one thing I've noticed is that um, initially I was experiencing a few more aches and pains. That's a consequence of living in a sin-cursed world. In fact, Paul writes that, that we, we groan and we travail in pain, and we experience that. But one day, we will be saved from the very presence of sin, delivered from this body of sin, and on that occasion, the biblical term for that is glorification. Past, present, future, justification, sanctification, glorification, and uh, we will experience that. In Romans 8, 23, Paul says, we groan within ourselves waiting for the adoption, in verse 29, he calls that the redemption of our body. He speaks of a day when we will be fully conformed to the image of his son, in verse 28, in our glorified bodies. And that is the future sense of our salvation. That's what Paul is speaking of. That future salvation delivered from the presence of sin, this body of death, the, the groaning that's going on, that will take place at a future time when we are with him. So we have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. It's in light of what we shall be that Paul is speaking in these verses when he says there in verse 11, now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Now, I gave you some references there uh, from other scriptures in reference to the day, the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, the day of the Lord Jesus, the day of Jesus Christ, the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, the day of redemption, the day of wrath, the day. And, and so the, the term day in general in scripture, at Old Testament as well, refers to a future day of God's judgment upon his enemies and deliverance for his children. So when he speaks of the day, that, is, that seems to be what he's focusing on here in this passage. Um, turn to 1 Thessalonians 4. I want you to notice a couple of things, and I'm going to start there, and I'm going to go on into chapter 5. So we're going to read a number of verses. So hold your spot here in Romans and go back to Thessalonians, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Start with me in verse 13. 
For I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. 1 Thessalonians 4.13. That you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't sorrow, but we don't sorrow as others. Those who, when we lose those who are asleep, those who have fallen asleep, it's appropriate that when we lose those we love, that there is some degree of sorrow and grief that goes with that. Verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and incidentally, if we don't believe Jesus died and rose again, we're not believers. That's the essence of salvation, the death, burial, resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, how that he died for our sins according to the scriptures, and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2, that reference in there, but that's, that's the, the, re, the resurrection. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. All right, now, a couple of things here. Those who have died are with the Lord. That's immaterial. The spirit, soul, personality, whatever that is, they are with the Lord and they will return with him. Their bodies are buried. Uh, I recall hearing of the Christian comedian and he specifically requested that at his funeral that one of the preachers say, we are here to commemorate the life of Grady Nut. You look in the casket and that's not him. That's just the shell. The nut's gone. <laughs> And, and, and so we need to understand that when we, when we go to a funeral of a believer, it's just a shell. And it will certainly be true. You can say that of me, uh, those, those of you who, who see that. And who was it we asked last week? What do you want people to say? Uh, and someone said, look, he's moving. I forget who that was. But in any case, in any case, uh, you can say that's just a shell. The nut's gone. And you'll be totally accurate. But add to this, the nut is with Jesus. Uh, absent from the body, present with the Lord. But anyhow, uh, with that in mind, immaterial is there. Verse 15, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. This is not Paul's idea. That we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, is the old English word, we will not precede them which are asleep. Immaterially they have gone on. Verse 16, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, voice of the archangel, trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's not talking about back row Baptists. Uh, the dead in Christ refers to those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. All right? Nothing, nothing personal there, Tommy. Uh, anyhow, all right, continue on. Wake up. All right, sorry. He, he was with me. All right, verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Harpazo is the, is the, is the Greek word. The Latin word is rapturum, from which we get our word rapture. I've heard people say, well, the word rapture is not in the Bible. Well, it is if you read the Latin Bible. Okay, that's where it comes from. Rapture, caught up. Uh, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with, the, with these words. All right, that's the day of the Lord. Verse Chapter 5, verse 1, he continues on. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Never know exactly when labor pains are going to start. Okay? But you know when it's getting close. All right, and we look at the signs and we want to say, boy, it's got to be soon, it's got to be soon, it's got to, I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. Verse 4, but ye brethren are not in darkness. Notice the analogy there, darkness, light, he's going to continue that in the next verse. You're not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. As believers, we know that the Lord Jesus can come at any time. So we shouldn't be caught unaware. We should always be ready. Verse 6, therefore let us not what? Same, same figure, same picture that he's using in Romans chapter 13. Wake up, the day is at hand, the night is far spent. Wake up, that's the idea. Let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. That was one of the arguments when they were saying, well, these men are full of new wine. Paul says it's still early in the morning. They'd have to be really, really bad alcoholics to be drunk at this time of the morning. They would normally be sleeping off what they had the night before. So they that drunk are drunken in the night. Incidentally, the Bible everywhere condemns drunkenness. Verse 8, let us who are of the day 
Be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love for a helmet of hope of salvation. God hath not appointed us to what? You know what the tribulation is a time of? It's a time when God's wrath is poured out upon this old world. And as believers, God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Verse 11 again, he says, Wherefore comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. I'm going to do verse, do verse 12 and 13 since that's a great verse, even though it's not right in line. We beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Sunday school teachers, uh, leaders in, in ministry, those who declare unto you the word of the Lord. Paul says that they watch for your souls in another place, but here he says they labor among you, they admonish you, esteem them for their work's sake. Now let me just say this, esteem them for their work's sake implies that, that they are doing a work of ministry. Respect is something that may initially be given to someone because of a position or title. But after that, it is something that is earned or it is something that is lost by the degree of faithfulness. That's an important thing to understand. You may go get a new job, you may have a new boss, and because he's the boss, initially he gets your respect and your admiration. He will either build that or he will lose that. Even if he loses it, as long as you're still the employee there, he's still the boss. I recall I went to work at a place once and they said there's only two rules for working here, okay? Number one, the boss is always right, okay? And number two, if the boss is ever wrong, refer to rule number one. And it's important to understand these, those basic things. All right, so light and day pictures here, but it's the day of the Lord. Back to Romans chapter 13. Because of the return of the Lord, because of the day, because of the time... The night is far spent, the day is at hand. I want to talk about the day is at hand for just a minute. I'm young, still young. I'm 58. There are a few of you who are younger than me, not that many of you. When I was 16 and 17, they were preaching about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the the. the the, the Cold War and the nuclear arms race is going on. You got the, pa the passage in, in Peter that says the elements will melt with fervent heat, the pass away with a great noise. And it's like, man, the bombs are going to go off and Jesus is going to come back and snatch us all out and I'm not even going to get to get married. I'm not even going to get to have kids. I'm not even going to get to go to college and raise kids and any of that because Jesus is coming back too soon. And I used to pray, Lord, don't come back yet. There's some things I want to do before you come back, you know. And uh, I was confident he was going to come back because they told me he's coming back soon. Now, we sh I shouldn't be too upset about them because people have often misunderstood the clear words of Jesus. Remember when Jesus taught about destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. What was he talking about? the temple of his body, but what did they think? Herod's temple. There's some discussion between Peter and John there at the Sea of Galilee after his death, burial, resurrection. He's meeting with them, bread and fish on the fire, and, and Jesus says to Peter, they're going to tie you up and they're going to bind you, carry you where you, where you don't want to go. Peter looks over and John says, well, what about him? And so Jesus says, well, if I will that he tarry till I return, what is that to you? You look at the next verse there in John chapter, let's see where I made, made the note of this here. Uh, it's in John 21, 23. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that that disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him, he shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? So they even understood the words of Jesus to Simon Peter concerning John. They misunderstood that. Now, there are a couple of key words 
that are often mistranslated and misunderstood in passages that talk about his return. And they are often translated as soon or near rather than at any time or rapidly and suddenly. When someone has rapid heartbeat, what do they call that? There's a medical term. Tachycardia. Does that mean that their heart's going to beat soon? Real soon their heart's going to beat. Is that what tachycardia means? Tachycardia means their heart is beating rapidly. They have a rapid heartbeat. The word, one of the key words for the coming of Jesus is the word tachos. And it does not mean soon. It means quickly. And the point is that when the events of his return start, they will happen quickly. They will happen suddenly. And so we need to understand that. And I try to guard myself. I try to be careful. Now, I believe Jesus has got to be coming soon. But the reality is he might not come for another 100 years. I'm not sure how that could happen. But he might, he might tarry for another 100 years or 200 years. I can't conceive of 1,000 years, particularly with what's going on with Israel and all the stuff over there. But the reality is we don't know other than the fact that he can come at any time. Did Paul believe Jesus may come in his lifetime? Yes. Absolutely, he did. How long has it been? 2,000 years? Was Paul wrong? No. If Paul had said Jesus is going to come before I die, he would have been wrong. But Paul said Jesus can come at any time. I think it's critical that in teaching and declaring the word, we be precise as to what God says and that we clarify as to what we believe. I believe Jesus is coming soon. That's my belief. That's my position on that. But I know that he can come at any time. And I also know that he might not come for years yet. Some of y'all been looking for his return a lot longer than I have. And you know what some people say? Let me just tell you. Some people who have heard this, Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. In the early 70s, mid 70s, late 70s. They finally said he ain't coming at all. Now, unless we get too upset about that, go to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. I want you to see this. And I think we want to start in verse 3. We might start in verse 2 since I quoted part of it. Hebrews, James, 1 and 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3. And go with me to um, verse 3. Second Peter 3, 3, knowing this first, and your notes, I think I, I send you to chapter, to verse 4, 3, 4, but starting 3, 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. There will always be scoffers, those who mock God, those who mock the word of God, those who mock the things of God. Sadly, sometimes they think they are mocking God, but in reality, they're mocking a preacher, perhaps something I've said that misrepresented what God said, because if God said it, it will happen. We understand that, right? If the preacher says it, maybe, you know. All right. Walking after their own lust, their own desire, epithumia. Verse, 14, verse 4. And saying, where is the promise of his what? To people who say that. He ain't coming. They've been telling me all these years he's coming. All these years I've been saying, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming soon. What we need to say is he can come at any time, not necessarily soon. But I understand, I get caught up in the emotion when I say that too. I think he's coming soon, but the reality is we need to live as though he might not come for a number of years. But we need to live as though he might come before we get done. Do you understand that? There's a balance in that. And the idea is awake, alert, ready. And they say, since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue. Verse 10, 2 Peter 3, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Do you know when a thief comes? When he thinks you're not looking. 
How many of y'all watched the news coverage of all the rigmarole up in, was it Ferguson, what, Indiana, Illinois, whatever? Did y'all watch that? The looter, Missouri, thank you. The looters would come in and they would burn the store down. But you know what? There were some places where people were sitting on top of the rooftops of their stores and in the parking lots of their stores with M16s and 12 gauges and 45s and whatever else. And you know what? At the end of the night, as day began to dawn, those stores were still standing. The point is this. If you are prepared, you're ready. And so the point is, be prepared. Be ready. Be prepared. I think I'm going to stop at Walmart and buy... Never mind. Okay, Continue back with the passage here. Now, whether he comes soon or whether he comes in 50 years, I'm still closer to my salvation. Because I might go to him first. That's okay too. Or he might come, but in any case, I made a decision to trust Christ when I was younger. I'm going to say when I was young. When I was younger. All right, so if he comes in one year, five year, 50 years, I'm still closer to my ultimate salvation than when I first believed. Okay, so the reality is this. Babies stumble and they they struggle to walk and they fall down. And as they get older, they should fall less. As we grow in Christ We should stumble less. We should fall less because we are growing. We are maturing. In light of that growth and maturity, that's what we should be. So wake up. The night is far spent. Day is at hand. Verse 12 gives a twofold exhortation. Put off, put on. The illustration is to getting dressed. You wake up, take off your pajamas. Put on your daytime clothes. I go through Walmart. And I, and I see these people and I want to say, wake up. Why are you wearing your pajamas? You know, I mean, that's just kind of become kind of weird. You know, I guess you just don't have to change clothes. You get up in your pajamas. End of the day, you go back to bed in your pajamas. Next day, you get up in your pajamas. You go to Walmart. It's like, what is wrong in any case? You just kind of scratch your head. You just, never mind. We need to understand that Paul is speaking based on a time and a culture when Timing was governed by the sun. Our time is governed by the clock because of artificial lighting. If you were going to work, you had to work when the sun was up. If you're going to try to work past sun up, you can have a problem because you can't see as good. Now, in our culture today, any of y'all ever seen those big old tractors and combines plowing 24 hours a day? Huge old lights. I mean, you know, like four or five wide with the, with the equipment, okay, because of lighting. It wasn't that way back then. They reckoned when it was time to go to work and when it was time to get up, not by their clock. Incidentally, I don't know if you ever thought about this, but sundials don't work real well in the dark. Just a thought, okay. Uh, so, so, so they work based on sun up. I've heard it, heard it said can see to can't see. And ideally, you want to get up and get going earlier, particularly in some cultures or some places, because at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, that's time for a siesta. Because it's 110 degrees in the shade. You want to get up at daylight, get three or four good hours in before it gets hot. And then maybe you can work some after the sun starts to go down. It cools down. So Paul is speaking in the day of Jesus and the apostles, work commenced at sunup and work concluded or work ceased at sundown. We just keep working after dark because we got more lights. And we sleep in after daylight because we've been working all night. All right, so understand it in that, in that culture. Now, think about this. There's the contrast between darkness and light and good and evil. Ye brethren are not in darkness that the day should overtake you as a thief, but children of light. We read that already. There's a focus up to this point on who we are in Christ. I want you to think about this. Paul is saying in light of who we are, here's how we should live. But who are we? 
we were, first of all, we're supposed to give ourselves to the Lord, a sacrifice. How many of you all have ever seen, I think it was probably the first Mission Impossible. Not Tom Selleck, Tom who? Who's the guy? Tom Cruise, thank you. How many of you all have ever seen Mission Impossible? Do you remember the section where he, 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 he uh, this old guy comes in, you know, and, and, and he's doing all this kind of stuff, and then he reaches and pulls, reaches down to his neck and pulls his face off, and it's Tom Cruise underneath that? You all remember that? Okay, all right. If you, if, you, if you didn't remember that, just picture somebody who looks like somebody else reaching down, grabbing hold of his neck and pulling off the face, and he's somebody else. The idea is put somebody else on. And the analogy is like getting dressed, like putting on your clothes. And here he says, put on Christ. Now, there are other exhortations. Put off and don't do certain things. In fact, let me just go ahead and hit that because I'm, I'm wrapping it up here. Back to Romans 13. Uh, cast off the works of darkness. Put on the armor of light. Note in your, in your, in your notes to Ephesians chapter 6 and the armor of God. Look at that. You can look at a soldier and tell if he's got his armor on, right? He's got his armor on or he doesn't, okay? All right, then he says, let us walk honestly or, or sincerely or rightly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness. The idea there has the idea of, of all kind of wickedness that would go with that. Uh, and not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. Uh, the strife and envying doesn't necessarily go with the darkness, whereas the chambering and wantonness and the, the debauchery and the drunkenness, that all goes with that. But since the strife and envying was a problem in Rome, Paul threw that in there too. Then he says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now think about this. The idea is that when we get up, we don't just put on the armor of God. After we put on the armor of God, we are to put on Jesus Christ. And the idea is that we are to be covered in Jesus Christ. If we have put on Jesus Christ, I'll go back to the movie illustration, that guy looked like the other guy. When people see us, we should look like the other guy. Do we get that? We should look like Christ. Paul told the Corinthians, be imitators of me even as I am of Christ. Now, I know we tend, to th we, we tend to think in terms of imitating as a negative thing, and particularly we would say, oh, no, don't do what I do. Do what I say. Don't do what I do. The reality is that we should be living our lives in such a way that if someone does what we do, they would be okay. Do we understand that? And if we have put on Christ, it means we have clothed ourselves in him. Now, from a spiritual standpoint, that's how God sees us anyway, right? We are covered in his righteousness. He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's justification. It's already covered. The idea is that when people look at us, they should see Christ in us. Make not provision for the flesh. The idea is don't live for the world. Don't live for the flesh. But let Christ live through us. That's how we are to live our lives. Christ in us the hope of glory. Maybe bow our heads. Father, I pray that in our lives that we would so completely and so accurately put on the Lord Jesus Christ that when people look at us, they're attracted to him because of our faithful reflection of what he is like. I pray, Lord, that we would grow up and behave in a way that draws others to the Savior. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. If you have any special needs, as always, we're available. Church family, remember the offering plates. Men, back here at 6 o'clock. God bless you all.